dear colleagues, uh, it is a pleasure and an honor for me to introduce uh, uh, the speaker for this year's East Coast uh, uh, lecture. He is a young, uh, at least compared to me, uh, brilliant researcher who received his uh, graduation in medicine in 2007 and uh, his PhD in spinal trauma in uh, uh, 2010 in the, um, in the Netherlands. And then he had several experiences around uh, Europe and uh, Australia. And uh, as a young researcher, he was able to raise uh, uh, more than one million grants uh, for uh, his researches. In 2012, he be became uh, uh, the first uh, research director uh, at the Stock Mandeville Foundation, and he's still uh, the head of the advisory board, scientific advisory board of Stock Mandeville. Uh, in 2015, uh, he uh, transitioned to biopharmaceutical uh, sector and is uh, the uh, leader of the medical liaison for several factories, um, and among these uh, uh, agents and uh, Pfizer. But uh, during all this time, he never stopped uh, uh, studying and publishing on uh, spinal cord injuries, and is the author of several uh, publications in different, uh, examining different aspects of uh, spinal cord injuries from working recovery. I remember one uh, great article uh, published on Lancet uh, establishing a rule uh, for the possibility of working recovery after a, a spinal cord injury and to obesity and to uh, the acute care uh, uh, after a spinal cord injury uh, which is the argument uh, of uh, today's lecture, and uh, that goes from the uh, pharmaceutical uh, treatment to the, to the timing of surgery uh, uh, soon after uh, the trauma. Uh, this year's speaker for the East Coast lecture is Jos van Middendorp, and uh, Jos, please. Thank you, Giorgio. Um, and what can I say? It's good to be here again with um, all friends uh, here in the audience. And um, I'm really honored and, well, delighted to be invited here by the organizing committee. Um, well, presenting an update on the surgery in spinal cord injury. I'd particularly like to um, thank uh, Giorgio, um, but also Dr. Uh, Mr. Ali uh, Jamous, um, who are really uh, wanted to have uh, attention to this uh, important topic. So, what you see on the screen is a title that was not announced in the in the in the program. So, it's a bit different, and there's a reason to that because in the last weeks, when I started preparing this uh, presentation, I thought, well, um, I can give you an ordinary, regular literature update, and everyone falls asleep. Um, uh, but I thought, well, one going through uh, the real, the bulk of evidence, so to speak, um, I noticed several things that I wanted to share with you um, and reminded me of what we've seen in the past. So what I would like to address here in the next 50 minutes is a more fundamental, a fundamental issue that we are now facing in, uh, in surgery, spinal cord injury, uh, and this is a lesson I hope uh, that's not only not confined to surgery, but to any interventional um, topic in spinal cord injuries. So, um, despite working in the industries, I do not have anything to disclose. Uh, and this presentation I would like to uh, dedicate to, um, well, uh, to other giants, if I may call them uh, that way, of Stoke Mendeville. I had the pleasure of working uh, with them uh, during my time uh, in Stoke. And uh, yesterday, uh, Professor Ashley Craig gave a very nice tribute to uh, Paul already. And uh, Dr. Hans Frankel doesn't need any further um, introduction or uh, words to, to it. So I really um, would like to thank these two giants, um, well, for uh, being able to, to have uh, spend time with these inspirational uh, persons. Um, talking about giants, I would like to show you one small video with uh, more words of uh, wisdom. 
Um, this is uh, Sir Bertrand Russell. Um, some of you may know that I'm a big fan uh, of his uh, well philosophies and uh, his uh, way how to address uh, mathematics in philosophy. Um, and here he, he's being interviewed uh, at the end of his uh, career, so to speak. And uh, this is a two minutes uh, video that is highly applicable uh, as of today. One last question. Suppose, Lord Russell, this film were to be looked at by our descendants like a Dead Sea Scroll in a thousand years' time. What would you think it's worth telling that generation about the life you've lived and the lessons you've learned from it? I should like to see two things. One intellectual and one moral. The intellectual thing I should want to say to them is this. When you are studying any matter or considering any philosophy, ask yourself only what are the facts and what is the truth that the facts bear out. Never let yourself be diverted either by what you would wish to believe or by what you think would have beneficent social effects if it were believed. But look only and solely what are the facts? That is the intellectual thing that I should wish to say. The moral thing I should wish to say to them is very simple. I should say, love is wise, hatred is foolish. In this world, which is getting more and more closely interconnected, we have to learn to tolerate each other. We have to learn some people say things that we don't like. We can only live together in that way. So very wise uh, words indeed. <laughs> so um, we can summarize the, the, this very powerful video in two words, facts and friendliness. Uh, but uh, Sir Bertrand Russell, he wasn't really always that friendly. He was sometimes quite controversial. Um, and I came across this interesting passage in this, uh, one of his master uh, works, um, The History of Western Philosophy, where he uh, reviews all the philosophers that uh, have been, uh, that we know from the past. And here he uh, addresses the philosophy of Dr. Thomas d'Aquinas. So let me read. There's little of the true phil philosophic spirit in Aquinas. He does not, like the Platonic Socrates, set out to follow wherever the argument may lead. He is not engaged in an inquiry, the result of which it is impossible to know in advance. Before he begins to ph philosophize, he already knows the truth. It is declared in the Catholic faith. If he can find apparently rational arguments for some part of the faith, so much the better. If he cannot, he need only fall back on revelation. The finding of arguments for a conclusion given in advance is not philosophy, but special pleading. So, what is special pleading? Special pleading is an argument in which the speaker deliberately ignores aspects that are unfavorable to their point of view. So, in more popular terms, it's moving the goalposts while the, play, uh, the, the match and the games is going on. Now, if we move uh, to the field of spinal cord injuries, um, I think uh, Dr. Daniel Lemertse, he gave an excellent uh, talk, a uh, Goodman lecture in uh, 2011, where he reviewed the, the interventional trials in spinal cord injuries, the randomized trials, particularly in, on methylprednisolone and the Sygen trials. He did it in a very exquisite and, and a very balanced uh, and, and, and nice way. So for those who are not overly familiar with what the Neskis uh, trials were, uh, there were three of them. Uh, the first one was a randomized controlled trial comparing high dose with standard dose in acute spinal cord injuries. Um, Neskis 2 um, was a, a randomized controlled trial with methylprednisolone uh, and naloxone and placebo. Um, the first trial didn't have any placebo uh, because there was, um, the there was no 
uh, believe that it would uh, be feasible to run the trials because of the, the equipoise issue. But then uh, the Neskis uh, group concluded that yes, there's an effect seen for acute um, administration of methylprednisolone in the Neskis 2 trial. So they continued with the Neskis 3, which was again a randomized controlled trial without placebo, but uh, the, the 24 uh, hours of uh, infusion was compared with the 48 hours of confusion. infusion. Um, so uh, Dr. Daniel Lemmetser, he nicely outlined uh, the history of that, uh, but also the, the challenges and the critique. Um, he was not the only one. So this is just a selection of many papers that raised arguments and, and criticism about the methodology of these Neskis trials. Um, one of the figureheads was Dr. John Herbert, um, a Canadian neurosurgeon who now practices in the United States. Um, and he had many concerns about the methodological quality. But um, there were many others. And interestingly, there was a whole editorial team from the Journal of Spinal Disorders that set out the concerns they had with these Neskis trials in a 15-page long paper uh, and really scrutinizing these two trials, uh, understanding what has gone wrong and what did, well, what, what did go well and what can we learn from it. So they identified four critical issues. So the first issue was really the questions on interpretation. The second issue was specific choice of methods. The third one was statistical procedures that were very sketchily documented. And fourthly, the primary data have appeared, apparently never made available. This is still the case as of today. They conclude science is not faith. A key component of science is reproducibility. The willingness to have one's conclusions open to question from every angle by all interested parties. Um, well, this is, uh, is now seems to be part of the history uh, but uh, during my PhD uh, time in, in Nijmegen, uh, whilst I was working on the, on, the, on the neurological recovery and prediction of spinal cord injuries, the outcomes of thereof, um, we were surprised to see this Cochrane review published by uh, Dr. Uh, Michael Brecken. And he concludes a high dose methylprednisolone steroid therapy is the only pharmacological therapy shown to have efficacy. So, um, that's interesting because we just saw there's a lot, a tons of critique, and regardless, there's this high profile Cochrane uh, library. Um, and, you know, uh, in preparing for this talk, I couldn't help remembering this scene of uh, <laughs> Dump and Dumber, like uh, with the hitchhiker. But um, we know that uh, Dr. Michael Brecken, he moved on to uh, work in other areas of research, um, and there was a, a successor. Uh, another Michael, uh, Professor Michael Failings, who uh, took on the debate, and he was a junior researcher in uh, the Neskis trials. Um, the special pleading, as I may call it, uh, continued. Um, and here he says, uh, in, a, in a counterpoint or an argument, pleading um, for methylprednisolone in acute spinal cord injury treatment, in summary, well, it's certainly true that the current evidence does not support the routine administration of methylprednisolone, a standard of care post-SCI. It is also true that there is no existing evidentiary basis to categorically recommend against its use as a treatment opinion in this context. Now, by reading this, I had to think about Bertrand Russell because I think he would have loved this sentence from a mathematical point of view. Uh, but he con uh, uh, they continued because therefore it is our assessment that the recommendations surrounding the use of methylprednisolone after spinal cord injury was best stated in the 2002 AANS-CNS guidelines as a treatment option that should be left to the discretion of the physician involved. Um, balancing the, the, the potential benefit and complication given the characteristics of the presenting patient. Now, what the authors do not uh, refer to is that there was an, actually an update of the AANS guidelines in 2013 that categorically recommended against the uh, use of uh, methylprednisolone. 
for moreover, the, 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 the Holy Bible of Acute Management, the ATLS, they, like any surgeon, they are, are straight to the point. There is insuffic insufficient evidence to support the use of steroids in spinal cord injury. So, if we move on from steroids to the scalpel to, to surgery, having all this knowledge uh, in the backs of our minds. Um, we also have to consider what is the true value of su uh, surgery in spinal cord injury, uh, having taken into account the lessons from uh, the Neskis trials. So what is important to consider, what's the underlying principle of um, acute surgery in spinal cord injury? The week at the time of surgical decompression of the spinal cord, there's the late, there's the early, and the earlier the better. So the earlier you go in, the, the, far, the better the enhanced uh, recovery. It's a very uh, simple uh, principle. Now, let's look at uh, the latest literature uh, on this topic then. So a couple of weeks ago, uh, I reviewed uh, what's on PubMed, uh, like many do, um, and this is the latest um, review um, on the clinical practice guidelines. Um, it is basically summarizing all the, the guidelines on the early intervention in spinal cord injury. And they conclude, yes, there are many caveats in, in, early, uh, in studies advocating early surgery, um, but eight of the 10 uh, do advocate for early surgery in spinal cord injury. It's interesting to see that these are not guidelines from the past. These are guidelines from the last decade. Um, so that is the, 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 those are the guidelines. A very a recent narrative review on the early surgical intervention concludes in recent years, strong evidence has emerged that supports the rationale that early surgical intervention within 24 hours following the initial injury is associated with better prognosis and functional outcomes. So here we are, we've got a review of the guidelines, we've got a review of the literature saying, all good, um, nothing to see here, let's move on and let's operate ASAP. Now, as I said, um, let's go for a deep dive. I don't think we'll have sufficient uh, oxygen with one uh, uh, bottle, so let's take a few more bottles for this deep dive. So this is the, the same uh, table from the same uh, review. Three studies that have been published are prospective and meet the criterion of at least 100 uh, subjects in the trial. I think we all agree that we need proper samples uh, for studying uh, an intervention like this. Um, so there's the uh, Staskis study by Failings. Um, there's this Keep Home study uh, that was recently published uh, by our group. And there's the Do paper. Not many people have heard of the Do paper. But uh, interestingly, this is the largest study on record. Um, due to time considerations, and I need to look at the time uh, also, the, uh, not running way behind, but um, Giorgio, you can uh, help me with that. Um, but I had prepared a few slides on this particular study, uh, but I think the bottom line is that in this particular study, uh, the differences in recovery seen in the Asian PAM scale group B uh, were the only subgroup that were statistically significant. But if you very carefully look at the data, uh, I would recommend you uh, to do so, then you see that the recovery patterns in both the early and the late groups are much worse than we have seen in other uh, registries and other trials. So that was the only group that was where the early group did better than late, but taking them all together, um, there was no uh, improvement versus normal recovery as we know it. Um, so then let's move on to the Steskis trial. So uh, the Steskis, not many of you know that the Steskis trial is not just the Steskis trial. There have been a number of Steskis trials. Um, and this was nicely reviewed by one of the uh, godfathers of the Steskis, Charles Tetter um, from Toronto. Um, and he, in this uh, particular review, he describes these studies. So Steskis 1 was a retrospective study aiming to assess the feasibility of an RCT. Uh, and Seskis 2 was a prospective cohort study 
uh, assessing the feasibility of decompression in, within 12 hours. And the Stesticus 3 um, is what we now know as the Stesticus study. However, there was one other study that was published and not included in the review of Tether, uh, Charles Tether, and there was another studying, uh, study uh, assessing the feasibility of the time window of within eight hours or within 12 hours uh, after injury. Now, the Stesticus. Uh, we call it the Stesticus, uh, but it can also be called the Stesticus 3. So what was this? I think many of the, in the audience know about the Stesca study. It was comparing early and late surgery for uh, cervical spinal cord injury with a threshold of uh, 24 hours. And uh, a stu this study was completed with, between 2002 and 2009. Neurological examination, ACS standards uh, with a level of injury, motor sensory scores, and a primary outcome was ordinary change, ordinal change of AAS impairment skill great uh, at six months follow-up. And the conclusion was, yes, early surgery is good. The compression prior to 24 hours is, can be performed safely as an effective, as um, shown by uh, improvement in the Asian impairment skill uh, uh, with at least two great improvement uh, uh, at six months follow-up. Now, we've seen a lot of critique at the NESCIS. How does this go for the STESCIS? Well, this is a kind of an empty field and a very empty space. So I, I've wrote a letter uh, soon after the, the publication and basically pointed out three concerns. One, there was no adequate description of the primary endpoint. Two, there was no sample size calculation. And three, there was an incorrect analysis with the too great uh, uh, Asian PEM skill improvement. And based on the data provided, uh, I did demonstrate that the difference was actually not significant between the early and late group. So there was a rebuttal from the auditors and it was quite hilarious because my argument for um, that there was no sample size calculation was turned against me because how could I run this analysis without a proper sample uh, size? So um, that was quite interesting. But now let's dive a little bit deeper into this test case. So, as, we, uh, as we've seen, the study did run between 2002 and 2009. In 2006, an interim excitement report uh, uh, was uh, published, and in the discussion, there was note of particular interest in this TASCIS project. Early results are showing trends towards improved outcomes with earlier intervention uh, and published data, uh, but the study is not yet complete. Two years later, at the AANS meeting in Chicago, the initial one-year results of the Stuskis were presented. So as you may recall, we had a Stuska study with a six-month outcome. Um, in 2009, um, there was another, a, a, a paper uh, by Failings, and uh, in the discussion, he says, however, emerging evidence uh, from the Stuskis supports the belief that the compression at the court within 24 hours of injury uh, is, uh, showing, is associated with improved recovery and, and this task is, is ongoing. So what we have here, we have an open label study that is not blinded in any way as we have seen in the NESC case. And we see interim reports being published and really making noise for the impact of early treatment. So please consider what this could, how this could affect the rater bias in any follow-up um, uh, assessment from the, for the patients involved in the trial. It becomes a little more interesting, actually, because um, in 2008, there was another paper published by uh, the group of uh, failings, and in, yet again, in the, in the discussion section, it says, in an effort to address the question of surgery in spinal cord injury, uh, with the highest possible quality, the task is uh, study um, uh, it was designed to be randomized. However, resistance to randomizing to an intentionally delayed decompression led to restructuring as a prospective observational study. The study has an accrual target of 450 patients. Uh, a two-year follow-up period is planned. Preliminary analysis suggests a benefit to early decompression based on an operational definition of early being less than 24 hours. 
So think about it. So this is an interim analysis that's being done and to say, okay, well, you know, the 24 hours, that seems to be the best cutoff. Remember, the Steskis 1 and 2 trials, we're focusing on the feasibility of the 8 and 20, uh, um, and the 12 hour cutoffs. A two year follow up was planned. We saw the interim data one year, uh, and in the ultimate report, we only have seen the six month follow up. So here we see a picture emerging uh, with many questions where are the data? What do the data say? Um, not to mention the shift from an RCT to an observational study. Now, for some people may be thinking, man, this guy is bashing the whole Stesca study. Well, I'm not, uh, I'm critical. Uh, I try to understand what does the data really say? What are the facts? What these Stesca uh, investigators did really good um, uh, is presenting raw data in the manuscript. Uh, because this allows us to reproduce some of the uh, analysis. This is what I've done. Uh, and this, this slide is basically a reconfiguration, a reconstruction of the Stesco data. We see on the left-hand side the same the tables that were presented in the manuscript. On the right-hand side, you see the percent uh, increase, um, improvement. Um, I think it's more useful to compare that because of the different samples uh, between the two groups. Now, if we look at the one great improvement, uh, on the right top side, you see that the, uh, the odds ratio for improvement, one uh, Asian PEM skill grade between early uh, and late, uh, was reported to be not uh, statistically significant. And if you look at the subgroups, uh, the same tendency applies. Now, we're now at the best slide of the, of, the, of the presentation, not because I love mathematics, but this is my daughter. She's, uh, she's six years old, um, and she's now going to uh, primary school, starting to write and read, uh, and also doing mathematics. Uh, and you know, you can recall from your group in school, you start counting with the hands. So then, if she's six, okay, I'm six years old. If you ask, okay, can you add four plus two, and one hand, she would do it like this, and then two, and then, and then she said, hey, no, that, that's not possible. So it's a very simple uh, calculation. Now, I think you uh, uh, understand where I'm uh, heading at, uh, because the investigators of the Stesca had a little bit more difficulty with it, because they included the Asian Grammar Skill D for the group that um, improved the two uh, Asian Grammar Asian Skill points. This resulted in a, um, a significant uh, improvement. But if you eliminate the numbers of Asian PEM skill D in the overall uh, study population, then you find out that the distribution of the Asian PEM skill is different and resulting in not a significant uh, difference. But there's more to this because this is kind of uh, uh, laid out in the, in the letter that I uh, sent before. But if we look at the data that is here, we see that the Asian PEM skill B, uh, that subgroup, is the main driver for showing two grades improvement. What happens by including Asian PEM skill D with the imbalanced uh, baseline is that the proportion of Asian PEM skill B uh, gets lower here, the 12%, if you add the Asian PEM skill D to it. So by uh, excluding Asian PEM skill D, then the proportion goes up for Asian PEM skill B, and that's how you end up with a more equal ratio of recovery between early and late. So what we've been looking at all the time, uh, and by citing the Stesca study, which is one of the most commonly cited studies in, uh, over the last 10 years with more than 1,100 citations, we've been copying the conclusions without really getting into the detail, what have you seen in the analysis? So this is really important. Another part that contributed to this distinction can be seen in Asian PEM skill C. We see 18% in the early group and none in the late group. If we go one slide back, that's my daughter again, really good. Um, we see in the table uh, that was presented in the manuscript, 
4 converted C converted to E 0 in the late group. So I know that in the audience there are people that have difficulties with the distinction between Asian PAM, Asia impairment scale D and E because it's a very arbitrary cutoff point where you can be completely normal but just one few bits that are not as normal as before the injury. So how much emphasis, emphasis would we put on that? So if we add these two arguments all together, then um, I think it's fair to conclude that the uh, significant difference that's been cited all the way along uh, is a little bit um, uh, over exaggerated and not really uh, reflecting the accurate, accurate um, things that happened in the study. Um, I, I'm very sorry because the time here is totally, uh, so how, how much time do we have left? Because can, can anyone tell me? Okay, great, thanks. Um, so uh, this, this is a, another um, interesting paper, meta-analysis. So people look for often at meta-analysis, at reviews. Um, and then, uh, 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 then I wondered, okay, what is this uh, meta-analysis about? It's about uh, recovery in spinal cord injury. Uh, and then I noticed that the same mistake was done in this meta-analysis as in this test case study. So we're pooling all patients, but as you can see, if you are looking for Asian two grades of improvement, you do not have to include Asian PM skill D. But in this meta-analysis they did, resulting in the over-exaggeration of the sample, and hence the whole meta-analysis can be thrown in the bin, because this is not the way how we should uh, conduct the analysis. But then we can ask, how did we come up with the Asian PM skill two? Uh, great improvement. In the Stasker's paper, there's reference to the Sygen trial um, because they also showed that um, too great improvement was considered as a marked recovery. But if you look at the Sygen trial, they didn't use the Asian PAM skill uh, classification. They used the, um, uh, the modified pencil classification, which got a completely different interpretation for two grades of recovery. So if we all add everything up to all together, we see there are a lot of things uh, to be critical on that have not been reported in the literature. Uh, I've covered several of these. There are a few others, but I need to uh, press on with the time. Uh, but I think the, the biggest caveat was the miscal uh, miscalculation of the two grade improvement uh, and various other uh, things that uh, altogether, we are quite reminiscent of uh, the NESCIS uh, suboptimal uh, issues. That said, we heard at the introduction of the TESCA study that the Asia impairment skill, um, the Asia cl classification was recorded, including neurological level of injury and motor and sensory scores. We haven't seen that. Um, Quick flashback to the 2015. Um, so the, in that, that at the time I was joining, uh, I had joined the industry working for it. I was invited to uh, present our um, systematic review that was published in the Journal of Neurotrauma in 2013 on the same topic. Uh, and in that paper, we demonstrated there was certain publication bias in this uh, area. Um, I did cite um, the, the wonderful book of Ben uh, Goldacre uh, bad pharma, and I, I read the complete book uh, before joining the industry, and I said to my wife, well, if I ever get into such an ethical, critical, concerning situation, I will step out. So uh, that was the pledge I made. Um, so at the same meeting, Michael Failings uh, presented a bit of his research. So publication bias uh, was a big thing, and in this book, um, uh, ben, Olga, ben Goldecker has a wonderful passage. For me, missing data is the key to this whole story. Bad behavior in marketing departments is unpleasant, but missing data poisons the well for everybody. If proper trials are never done, if trials with negative results are withheld, then we simply cannot know the true effects of the treatments that we use. Little did I know that six years later, there was emergence of uh, 
unreported data. Because we have seen now the, 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 the pooled analysis from Badiwala, uh, where they concluded that surgical uh, treatment within 24 hours or 36 hours for that matter is beneficial uh, based on this pooled analysis. As maybe some of you know, this is a combination of the Nectin uh, registry, the NESCIS-3 study that we covered before, the STESCIS and the SIGEN trial. One of the four studies really focused on the role of surgical decompression. The others did not. The authors mentioned that all of the studies had Asia examination uh, as part of the database. The NESCIS-3 trial wasn't really done according to the uh, Asia examination. There were 14 muscle segments that were used in the trial and bilateral assessments were taken. Um, there was no comment on this, uh, how this was processed or calculated in the pooled analysis. So I did a little bit of research um, and I found this paper of uh, Weiss Young explaining the connection between the Nescus key muscles and the Asia uh, key muscles. More recently, after the publication of the uh, body value pooled analysis, there was another paper that nicely showed, yes, you can connect the Asia um, uh, International Standard key muscles with the ones that uh, were covered in NESCIS. So, well, not reported in the study, but you can make the connections, and we can argue how valid these connections are, but it's been well described. More importantly, there was a different way of rating motor function in NESCUS and the, the international standards, which is important if we end up with uh, results like there's a motor score improvement favoring early of, let's say, two to five points, then these differences do matter. Uh, and this particularly is applicable in the uh, motor score four to five, this different way of assessing and in interpreting. The real shocker for me in the Badiwala paper was this. So, if we look at the baseline data in the Stasticus paper, Stasticus paper, and that was what was used in the Badiwala pooled analysis, there were suddenly 32 more late subjects. Um, in a real confined study, normally that's not the case. Either you're in or you're out, uh, and if you're out, there's no follow-up as per protocol. But the real shocker for me was that if you look at the patients in the Asian PAM skill categories, suddenly half of the Asian PAM skill B patients disappeared to nowhere. So from 54, they were reduced to 27. <clears throat> we, we discussed before that the main driver for a two Asia grade impairment uh, was coming from the Asian PAM skill B subclass. So this is a mystery to me. Well, the shockers came after the shockers um, uh, to me because uh, we mentioned that in the Stasis trial there's no much mention of motor points of recovery. Suddenly, in the pooled analysis, these feature and these emerge. So I I'm, I'm quite bold here and I think uh, I'm, I'm making a very strong statement. This is not bad pharma, but is, this is surgical science that sucks. This, I cannot believe that these Tescus investigators forgot about reporting motor points in their primary analysis. So what we have seen now from these Tescus conclusion, so there was conclusion two grades in uh, Asian payment skill improvement, significant, hallelujah, and now we're looking at the pooled analysis. We see a non-significant difference in the motor score points. But it gets more interesting, actually, because what about the SIGEN trial? We know the SIGEN trial was a failed trial. The, 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 the investigators mentioned that in their abstract. They were clear about it. They actually said in a non-operated group, there was a bit more recovery that we did see. Then, if we look at the Badiwala pooled analysis, suddenly in the pooled analysis, we see an improvement of 5.4 total motor points 
uh, favoring early surgery. So basically, the, in the pooled analysis, the Sygen data has been rewritten. It's getting really even more confusing because there was a more recent publication by uh, Geisler, including uh, Dr. Felings, that said, we did another analysis of the NESCIS-2 and the Sygen database. And yes, after all those years of discussion with the NESCIS data, um, we now have the truth. Methyl prednisolone in the early uh, acute phase does not improve um, neurological recovery. But then, you would, you, then I would think, okay, that's all nice and, and well, but two years earlier, you showed that surgical treatment was a strong predictor for recovery. So why did you not account for that in the database? Which was not done. I will skip this part, this is a bit uh, technical uh, and, and boring. I hope the other slides are not too boring, by the way. This one is nice. So this is the curve, uh, which is a very nice hallmark of the paper, where all the data is being uh, pulled and analyzed. Um, and uh, the conclusion is that there's a, a, a relation um, between the time of surgical decompression and the recovery in motor points as expressed in the y-axis. Um, so, in the editorial, they are copying the, the interpretation of the, of, the, of the authors, saying that what has now been shown, uh, that uh, time is a continuous variable, that early decompression is better, but also highlights the fact that benefits of early surgery might exist up to 36 hours after spinal injury. No one had a problem with that interpretation. Well, I do, because I'm showing you this. My interpretation of this graph is, if no spinal surgery can be performed within the first 24 hours, the next best timing for surgery is six, seven days post-injury. Because why would you go for less recovery after 24 hours? If you can wait, you will get more recovery seven days later, six days later. So, we have seen a proof of publication by it. Negative motor score outcomes are not reported in the Seskis paper. We cannot know the exact neurological data um, in that were present in the original paper because in the pooled analysis there were a lot of modification with regression analysis, etc. So we cannot know now. Uh, we also found out that these Tesco's data were not the actual Tesco's data because there, were, there was quite some manipulation and data massage uh, on the, 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 the data that went in. We know that there were different uh, neurological assessments and moreover, three other data sets were used to empower uh, data from this Tesco's. So in conclusion, no valid positive neurological outcomes for Tesco's study have been reported to date. So once the Betty Wilder paper uh, was out, we wrote a, a letter to the editor um, outlining few of the bits that I presented earlier. Uh, I can give an entire new lecture on the interactions that uh, took place between the editorial committee. I won't do that, I don't have the time, but the outcome was clear, the letter was rejected. So, now, this, this, uh, this keep home study that um, in 2011, when I was in Australia waiting for my furniture to arrive, I started drafting the study design of this uh, particular study. And in the decade after that, um, we worked with many European collaborators across acute centers and rehab centers to get this up. And, and Giorgio is uh, signaling to me, uh, you have not much time left. I think, um, that's okay, after 10 years of hard work, I'm fine with five minutes. I think for this lecture, what is more important is to be aware of the other data. And I let others to scrutinize our paper, our data, and see what is the validity of, of that. Um, what I would like to say about our, our study um, is the following. So we came up with a, a, a protocol that was signed off before we ever saw the data. There was no interim analysis over the last 10 years. 
that was uh, community. We, we didn't know any of those data. Uh, and we had a statistical and analytical protocol also signed off. So there's no dredging or whatsoever. Um, so I wanted to, to say that. Um, I'll, I'm jumping through a slide. Uh, yes, there were baseline imbalances, as like the uh, uh, Steska study. But here, I now study, they were a bit more pronounced. We addressed them for the propensity score, which was all defined a priori. I'm skipping a little bit more quickly. What we have seen in the univariate analysis, there was a tendency for recovery, more recovery in the early group, which was defined before 12 hours. But correcting for baseline characteristics, this whole tendency disappeared, and we did not see any difference between early and late. In the uh, Asian PM scale groups, we did see uh, uh, in the subgroups, which were not powered, so our statistician became totally allergic and anaphylactic uh, when uh, we asked for the subgroup data. But here you can see there's no clear differences in these small subgroups. Um, I, I implemented a joke uh, later, um, but I don't have the time for that. Um, but I, I reconstructed the, the, the Steskes uh, study. Um, so uh, we didn't um, find any uh, improvement uh, for two grades if we done it the appropriate way. Uh, but if we were doing like the Steskes way, then this would be the result. So we would be confirming the Steskes conclusions. Now, I could only imagine how the Steskes uh, folks would uh, respond. Um, so we had some uh, criticism, and I think let, let's skip that. Maybe you have criticism. I'm happy to uh, address um, some, some um, surgeons putting more emphasis in favor to unadjusted analysis rather than adjusted analysis. Um, this is an interesting. So this is the paper that um, I mentioned earlier before. High quality stescus uh, on the left-hand side, milestone. And on the right-hand side, you see a challenge of the Skipom study. Um, uh, but I, I'll leave that for now. That is also for the community to follow up on. So in conclusion, the rise and demise of the Nesca studies from uh, the 90s is still palpable in spinal cord injury care. Widespread criticism of Nesca was never addressed satisfactorily. Two decades later, we have the Stesca study results that were embraced by the community with many guidelines supporting early surgery decompression following traumatic spinal cord injury. Until today, published Tesco's data have not been subjected to a critical appraisal. Recent proof of publication bias of Tesco's data come on top of presented evidence of shortcomings in trial conduct, reporting, and analytical procedures. And I'm biased here, but the rigorous uh, Skipoam study did not demonstrate benefits for early surgery. The impact and co of confirmation and publication bias in this field cannot be overemphasized. So here's my call to action for the society. As done at the time for NESCIS, as we've seen, experts in the spinal cord injury research have a duty to scrutinize the evidence that does or does not support the time is spine mantra. So these were the closing thoughts. Uh, this was really about a lack of time, which is quite applicable uh, as of now. Um, but you know, the, the, the scrutinizing literature takes time. And it's time that we all do not have. So I can be can come across quite arrogant by saying, well, do your job. But this is not easy. We have patients to attend to. We've got our own research to uh, publish. So everything is getting marginalized in the critical issue. So I hope that I inspired the community uh, and society to take on uh, this critical appraisal moving forward. I would like to thank um, my, all my friends and colleagues from different places. And uh, herewith, uh, thank you very much for your attention.
Yes, uh, if there are some questions, I'm happy to take them. I appreciate that there's a poster session that is uh, now uh, um, going to take place. So please feel free to come forward. Okay, thank you very much.